grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is John 20, 26. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Today is the one week anniversary of Easter, the day that Jesus appeared to Thomas and put to rest all of his doubts. A quick review of events leading up to this anniversary reveals a clear divine pattern. The first appearance of Jesus was to Mary Magdalene. Before she recognized him, you recall she thought he was a gardener, Jesus speaks. And then, once he speaks, she knows that Jesus has been raised. This is our divine pattern. First, the word, and then faith. She was sent to tell the other disciples some other ladies also visited the grave and got the word of the resurrection from the angels that were there. And then after that, they're coming back home and they meet Jesus. So And Jesus speaks to them. So again, we have that divine pattern. First the word and then faith. <clears throat> Jesus... Uh, appears that, you know, so then, so these ladies are telling the disciples all this that's going on, and two of the disciples had to leave and return to Emmaus. So they're walking along the road, talking about all the terrible things that had happened with Jesus, right? And they're talking even about how some of these crazy ladies, you know how women are, okay? <laughs> They were silly enough to think that Jesus had been raised from the dead, but all his level-headed guys, we knew that sort of stuff was impossible. And along comes this guy, and he starts talking with them, and he does this wonderful Bible study, and he shows how the Bible, through and through, the Old Testament here, always said that Jesus had to come, he had to suffer, he had to die, and he had to rise on the third day. And then at that evening meal, he reveals himself to them after Jesus, as Jesus, and disappears. So again, we see that divine pattern. First the word, and then faith. So they hustle on back, and we have an Easter day appearance of Jesus, which is reported, but not chronicled. That is to say, there's, uh, we're told that Jesus appeared to Peter, but we don't have the story. What we can safely assume, I think, is that the divine pattern is still there, which is first the word and then faith, because he had the testimony of the women and then Jesus comes up and he probably says something like, peace be with you, or come on, get with it, Peter, or something else very spiritual-like, you know. The thing is, you know, we probably again had first the word and then faith because every other time when we have the story actually told, we see first word and then faith. So the Emmaus Road disciples get back and they're telling the, the other disciples, hey, Jesus has been raised from the dead. And they're saying, you know, we're beginning to get that idea ourselves. After all, we had the ladies. And then Peter came in and said, He'd seen Jesus, and now you guys are coming in, and you're seeing, saying you've seen Jesus, and then Jesus appears to them in our gospel lesson, and they believe, and so we have, again, first the word, and then faith. Now, for some reason, Thomas wasn't there. It does not appear to be malicious or anything like that because, you know, a week later today, the octave of, e of Easter, Thomas is there. And they're all saying, Thomas, you've got to believe, you've got to believe. Because this has turned out to be the way God normally works. He works faith through the word, through the gospel. 
So, uh, Thomas, as you know, doesn't believe. Now, you should know a little bit about Thomas. He's really not a bad guy. He's a good guy, actually. He has faith. He just doesn't have faith in the resurrection. The, when Jesus says we need to go down to Jerusalem because I'm going to go raise Lazarus from the dead, and all the disciples are saying, this is a bad idea. They want to kill you in Jerusalem. And it becomes obvious that Jesus is going to go to Jerusalem over the objection of his disciples. It is Thomas who says, let's go with him, that we may die with him. He had enough faith to follow Jesus to the grave. He just didn't believe there was anything beyond the grave. He would like to believe. It would be wonderful. It just was too fantastic. So Jesus comes to him, and he says, and he greets everybody with peace. And then you know the story. We just heard it. He says, you know, look at my side. Look at my hands. It's me. You should believe. But then what does he do? He says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and receive it. Because the pattern that God has established to engender faith in our hearts and our lives is not burning bushes, is not Jesus appearing for our evening meal, is not being knocked off our donkeys while we're traveling. Yes, God can do these sorts of things. But how many times did he appear in a burning bush? Anybody? Once. How many times did he knock somebody off a donkey? How many times? Once. You know, and we could go on. His normal way is to work through the word of God to bring our hearts to faith. And so he tells Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen but believe. Finally, <clears throat> you know, he, so he appears, removes Thomas's doubts, but he directs us to the word as the means by which the Holy Spirit works. And that, by the way, is the first lesson from today's readings. First the word, and then faith. The second lesson, <clears throat> you know, is that, you know, Christ chooses to engender faith in us through the, through the gospel. You know, and that's why uh, even our sacraments, by the way, are based on the word of God, are they not? The word, the baptism, and uh, communion. Take away the word from baptism, and what are you left with? Water. Take away the word from the Lord's Supper, and what are you left with? Bread and wine. That's right. So it is, even our sacraments are built on the word this is how the Holy Spirit works. Take away the word from absolution, and what do you get? A lot of hot air, right? You know, it's always the word through which the Holy Spirit works. It's his normal pattern. When you think about it, how does Genesis tell us the world was created? Through the word, huh? That's the very first thing God said, okay? Okay. Uh, now, it has grown more and more popular these days to seek God apart from the word, apart from the gospel, apart from the message of Christ and his resurrection. This is a deception of the devil. Our generation is falling for it hook, line, and sinker. It's the same ploy the devil used on Adam and Eve, pulling them away from the word of God and Search your heart, or something like that. The truth of God is found in the word. It is centered in Christ. So we ask an Asian creed, and this is the Christian faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Faith without the crucified Christ and risen Christ is a false faith, and it leads to damnation. It is the word of God that leads us to Jesus, leads us to that crucified and risen Christ and confirms that faith. It is the word of God that sustains that faith. 
It is God's chosen pattern. Word, then faith. So, uh, <coughs> we move on to the second lesson then. Because God chooses to work through his holy word, his almighty power is veiled. We don't get to see it. It comes through the word. It's not as if God has appeared in all his glory and shining like he does on the second at the second coming. Let's just say that the second coming happened every day. I know that sounds silly, but let's just say the second coming happened every day. Who would doubt that Jesus was the Son of God? No. We've got all that power and might shining forth. It would be so obvious that even a blind person would know. But that's not how he has chosen to work. He has chosen to work through the word of God and empowering the means of grace, sacraments, and so forth. Because it is done this way, it is resistible. You can hear that word and say, that doesn't make sense. You can hear that word and say, I don't want to do that. You can hear that word and say, I won't believe in a God who fill in the blank. This is what, excuse me, <laughs> this is why the omnipotent, all-powerful God can be resisted by us poor, weak, miserable sinners. Um, so that is uh, the second lesson, you might say, that he works in this resistible way through the word. Our third lesson comes from the words of Jesus. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathes on the, the people gathered there and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain them, they are retained. And that is what we call the office of the keys. Or if we were to put that in a sort of Lutheran terminology, the office of law and gospel the law part is the retaining of sins, and the gospel part is the forgiving of sins. But once again, we see God working through the word to bring to us forgiveness and life and salvation, or to warn us to stay away from hell. So, you know, the law part or, or the closing or the retaining key would be when you warn somebody and you say, don't keep doing that. Really, it's a bad idea to keep robbing banks. Not only is it an illegal way to make a living, and you will one day get caught and thrown in jail, but it is also a sinful way to make a living. Repent, you know, before you go to hell. This is the law part. And the gospel part is the guy says, I've been robbing banks. I'm really sorry about that. I really need to get my life straightened up. And then you say, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. You might want to tell the police about this or at least the lawyer. <laughs> you know, but, you know, you, you, um, you offer that forgiveness there. Now, the importance of this comes through the word and uh, then faith. If I were to stand up here for the absolution and just think you guys forgiven, that's not quite it, is it? If I was just feel you forgiven and say nothing, that doesn't quite get the job done either, does it? Would you feel that forgiveness oozing out of me? No, you have to speak it, just like you have to speak it. And then it is really God's word coming from you or me, you know, in the worship service. So, First, the word, and then faith, which is engendered. And we have this special privilege given in our lesson here, when he says go, of carrying that very same word that the apostles carried. And it has the same power and the same authority that it had when the apostles proclaimed it. It brings the same Savior, the same faith, the same eternal life. God has entrusted us with the this pearl of great price, 
He has hidden it in human words. He has given it to us earthen vessels. But he hasn't given it so that we may hide it. We are to uh, share it. We are to let it shine forth uh, in our lives. Now, here is something that we need to be a little bit clear about, and this comes through, especially actually in our lesson from Acts. Uh, we see a picture in Acts, a little vignette from the life of the early church, don't we? And uh, the apostles are, are proclaiming, it says, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord, and great grace was upon them all. So there again we have that pattern. First words, and then faith. But notice in our lesson from uh, Acts that that faith acted. And people were uh, making sure that the poor were taken care of and all sorts of great things. Now what we see here is an important point for our continuing life. The actions of the Christians did not convert anybody. God works through the word to bring people to faith, to call together and lightly sanctify. He works through the gospel. But what the actions did was provide a lure. Think of your actions in terms of the burning bush, right? Did seeing the burning bush cause Moses to come to faith? No. What did it do? It got him to come on over, didn't it? He came over and he said, what in the world is going on this, you know? I'm going to turn aside and see this marvelous sight. So our actions get people to ask, why in the world do you act this way? What is so different about you? It is a lure, if you're a fisherman, you know, attraction. And then the person asks, and then you can share your faith in a very natural and normal way, and then the Holy Spirit works through that proclaimed word, that shared word, the gospel, to create faith. A good example of that is uh, found in Acts chapter, uh, what is that, 16, where Paul is in jail and uh, with some, com some friends, and there's this big earthquake, and the doors are shook open, and the chains fall off, and the jailer apparently had been snoozing, wakes up, and he's ready to kill himself because that was the penalty if, if the prisoners had escaped, and he thought everybody had escaped. And Paul shouts out, don't kill yourself. We're all here. So the jailer checks things out really quick, and sure enough, they are there, and, uh, and he's very, very excited, needless to say. He says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and the others who are with him said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Now this is the next part of the text uh, out of Acts, which is so very important. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. First the word and then faith. And after they had spoken the word of the Lord to them, the jailer and his whole household are baptized. So the point here for us is that it was the actions of Paul and his associates that created an opportunity to share the gospel, to share the resurrection. So today we have heard, actually, from our, le from our reading, four lessons. First, the normal way God creates and sustains our faith is through the word of the gospel. Second, because God chooses to work through the word instead of simply overwhelming us with his omnipotent power, he, his saving action for people, is resistible. There is no such thing as irresistible grace. Third, he has granted us that same power, that same word to proclaim and share. And fourth, our lives become something attractive so that the unbeliever will give an ear to the word instead of just shutting us down automatically. Now today, uh, and I've spoken about this before, but today is the official beginning 
uh, as a church, we're going to try to walk around in our neighborhood. And in doing this, we're hoping that you will meet your neighbor. And if you live in an apartment building, you may just want to walk around the apartment building or something like that. But the idea is to meet your neighbors. Be friendly. Introduce yourselves. Ask them their names, that sort of stuff. And we hope that as you get to know your neighbors over time, they might naturally ask you about your faith. Perhaps it will be something like they're going through a difficult time or somebody in their family is going through a difficult time and they say, would you pray for them? And you say, yes. Perhaps uh, they're going, having something special. Maybe a new grandchild is born or something like that. And they, you know, you have a chance to rejoice with them. Perhaps it's something uh, much more uh, everyday like. Oh, that car is having problems and you happen to know somebody who can fix cars really well, and so you pass on the name. Whatever it may be, it's just getting to know your neighbors. Uh, and the hope is, what we hope is, is that over time, some discussion about your faith will naturally develop. They may ask you when they're going through that difficult time, about your faith and how it might work. They may even ask if they could see your pastor or something like that. But the main thing that we're just looking for here is to walk and say hello. And to encourage us in this endeavor, we have on the bulletin board there a, uh, uh, an empty chart right now because today is the official beginning, right? So I, I would not expect anything to be put on there until next week. But there is a chart on the bulletin board in the hallway which has a place for you to put your name and then how far you walked in your neighborhood this week. Five miles, 10 miles, 478 miles, whatever you do, you know. And then we will keep track of that and we're hoping that as a church we will have walked in our neighborhoods uh, 2,015 miles, which will honor, honor the year 2015, which is the year we're in. And that's why we picked it. Uh, but anyways, uh, that hopefully will encourage you by seeing how far the church as a whole is walking as well. But remember as you walk that you have the same powerful word that the apostles had. That word that comes before faith has been given to us. So don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to share it. Don't be afraid to see the opportunities that God gives you. Amen. May the peace of God which passes human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.